everyone, and welcome to the next episode of Esquire's Man at His Best podcast. This is our weekly look at some of the biggest things that have happened this week in the world of men's lifestyle, including updates from our very own website and magazine. I'm Tom, the digital director of Esquire Middle East, and I'm joined by my audio partner in crime, Matthew Baxter Priest. How are you doing, Matt? I'm alright, man. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Has it been a week already, Tom? It has been a week. Fair. One whole week. <laughs> I mean, we fit, we sit fairly close to each other at work, so it doesn't feel like a week, does it? It doesn't feel like a week. It feels like I sat next to you just earlier today. I, we were. Chatting idle. Chatting idle. Crushing work. Yes, pretty much. Uh, so as regular listeners know, uh, we bring the funny, but also there are three sections in this podcast. First, we talk about news, and then we talk about something a little bit meatier, and then we talk to someone that embodies the man at his best, Esquire ethos. So Matt, you're looking after the, uh, the 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 meaty bit and the interview. What can we look forward to? Um, well, we touched upon it a little bit about yesterday. For the middle kind of a meatier segment, um, we're going to be looking at a feature that is in currently published in the May 2018 issue of Esquire Middle East. Now, those watching on video on our YouTube channel on the video podcast, you can see me holding up the magazine now. For those who can't, it's a rather fetching blue cover with the Welsh Hollywood A-list actor Luke Evans on the cover. He's wearing a greeny jacket, greeny kind of brown jacket, summer styling jacket. Um, this issue is chock full of stuff and we will be focusing on one of the main features in the issue. Uh, it was written by one of my writers uh, and it focuses on the growth of the Chinese car industry, Tom. It's a fascinating read and it's about why we will all be driving Chinese cars sooner rather than later. Well, good. Well, let's just start the show. Cool. So some really good local news straight off the bat. Uh, Donna Benton, who is a good friend um, of Esquire, uh, she won our Woman of the Year last year. She was our, she was our Entrepreneur of the Year, Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, um, she was at our Esquire townhouse um, talking all, all things entrepreneurship. We also had a, another sit-down event. Yeah, look, uh, Don is a good friend of the brand. She's a wildly successful um, Dubai-based entrepreneur, a uh, lovely lady, and um, and you've got some good news about her her company. Well, we heard just yesterday that she's actually sold her business, uh, which is the Entertainer, which is kind Done. of now it's an app that kind of gives you two for one deals um, on just about everything. Now there's even like a retail e-com thing where you can get half price deals on things. Um, she sold it for a nine figure sum. <laughs> Nine figures. Which is a tidy profit considering she started the company in 2001 from nothing. So, yeah, nine figures being 100 million? The, well, nine figures, it's upwards. It could be anything. It could be any nine figures. But obviously the smallest nine figure sum would be 100 million US dollars. Wow. Well, congratulations, Donna. And well deserved, really. Party at her house. Party at Donna's tonight. So um, she actually sold an 85% stake. So assumably she's keeping 15 um, for herself in case, you know, she ever wants to sell some more. Well, stuff, I, ma- I, I imagine that the, 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 the formula of the entertainer is <laughs> it's, uh, scalable still. So I, I think that so. makes sense to hold on to a bit of it. Who she sold it to? Uh, to GFH Financial Group, which is a Bahrain-based... Um, financial kind of investment company. So it has said that it's going to be investing a further 150 million into the app. Wow, okay. So th- then that would be to, to kind of globally expand it because over the last couple of years, it has done things like go digital, um, expand into some different markets. But I'm guessing uh, this group wants to take that even further. Yeah, well, understandably. Um, look, I've been, I've owned the entertainer book, been buying the entertainer books for long before they went digital and with the app, which they went kind of paperless earlier this year, am I right? Thank mm-hmm. you. Yep. Um, it was either earlier this year or the very end of yeah, last year. Was, this, this, was, this year was the first completely paperless. So, um, yeah, well, congratulations to her. And uh, it kind of, it's another success story for entrepreneurs starting up businesses here in, in the UAE. Mm-hmm. Um, well done, Donna. Yeah, congratulations to her. Yeah. I'm sure she's listening to this. Hi, Donna. Hello. Donna. Party at your house. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a little bit more entertainment-based news, Tom. Okay. One for you. Actually, might not be one for you. I'm not entirely sure how big a fan you are. I am. Uh, the t- Netflix have just announced that the TV show Arrested Development is back, Tom. Mm. Season five. Mm. But this is a great thing for Arrested Development fans because season four was rubbish. Yeah, because didn't they cancel season three and then Netflix picked it up and made a rubbish fourth season and now they're going to make a presumably, hopefully, a better fifth season? Yeah, I want to say... and. I- 
check me on this, but I think someone like Yahoo picked it up. Netflix no, season. that was, was community. That was community. Sorry, yeah, sorry. So yeah, Netflix. It was rubbish. You also the, made a rubbish season. <laughs> there's a trend there, but look, I was a, you know a massive fan of Arrested Development growing up. Um, well, when I was you know in my earlier twenties and late teens, the um, what makes season five that Netflix can promise uh, that it will be it will be better than season four. Mm-hmm. Season four was kind of the format slightly changed. They kind of pieced together the, they worked around the actor's schedule. So, you know, uh, if for those who are familiar or unfamiliar mm. with the rest of development, your actors kind of made the careers of people like Jason Bateman, Michael Cera, Will Arnett, mm. um, obviously Je- Jeremy, uh, is it Jeffrey, Jeremy Tambor? So Jeffrey Tambor, um, Jessica Walters already ha- were established actors, but mm. you know, they bring that kind of. So are they all back? Up. They're all back. And instead of the season four kind of being filmed in, single uh, episodes concentrating on the individual characters. Mm-hmm. It's, again, going back to the format that they had in season one, two, three, where it's about the the family as a whole, the Bluth family. Mm. Um, uh, if you are aware of the show, it's basically a big kind of farcical comedy, um, quite, quite well, supremely dry, no laughter track. It's all very kind of good wit, if I yeah. was. So. I once read a book, Tom, um, That's good. At least one. <laughs> You're welcome, yeah. Very good. No, I want Congratulations. to Congratulations. And the book was entitled Things White People Like. Okay. And you open it in the first page, it just said Arrested Development. Fair. And I laughed. Fair. I mean, I don't... I don't... I, I'm, a, I'm a white man, and I dislike it, so, I mean, I wouldn't go painting all of us with the same brush. No, but it's that... That's the kind of humor that it involves. Like, Fair. it's it's that very kind of, you know dry humor mm. not not exclusive to white people or people or women or men or anything of any description it just um it just made me laugh that book that referenced it um yeah so that's back um they just released the trailer it's now available on netflix but you're probably going to watch it on youtube anyway no so is it going to be is, is it all up in one go or is this are they going to drip feed it no like? it'll be all up in one go and i think the 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 theme of this is for people who are fans um the the theme of it is that uh Portia de Rossi's character mm. will be running for like a uh, mayor or, or town council there, um, and it's about that kind of that. I think she says the phrase in the in the trailer, "I want to be part of the problem mm. and not part of the solution." Well, good. I I trust you'll enjoy that. I will. I'll keep you updated. Well, well, let's move on to something that potentially I enjoy, but you don't really do enough of. I don't understand why we're friends. We seem to be a uh, we seem to have wildly different uh, interest groups, but it works well for this show. Well, so um, I've got video game news. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a new game out, and that's called God of War. Uh, it's a PlayStation exclusive, so Xbox and PC players need not apply. Um, but it's the next in in kind of the long line of the series. Hmm. So to give you the the short the short summary, because I assume you haven't played it. I have not. No. Uh, it follows the protagonist Kratos, who is predictably the... Is he the god of war? He is. There you go. Um, so, and he like hacks and slashes it. his way around ancient Greece. Okay, so this one is different. Hmm. And that's why this has really kind of got... It's gone a bit mainstream. Tell me more. So this one has got... Instead of just, like, hacking, slashing monsters, jumping on their backs, stabbing them in the eye, stuff like that, it's quite a gory game, this. Uh, I think there's, like, an 18-year-old... No under 18s are allowed to play. There's an 18 year old telling you that no under 18s are allowed to play. Um, this one has all of the feels. Okay. So Why? this one, other versions of the game. Apart from, um, aside from all the slashing and hacking and mass murder and that. Like, well, some people just are very bad at expressing their feelings. Fair enough. And therefore may turn to just slaughtering all of the ancient. Greek gods, okay. so which is this... basically the act. That's what happens Fair in that. Fair? Yeah, I suppose that, that's what happens. What is the feel? What creates the feels? So, kind of, uh, yeah. Usually, um, something happens. Thinly veiled plot. You have been slighted in some way, and it's up to you to get revenge. Kratos goes and, and he just goes after all the all the different gods. Fine. Uh, these are ancient Greek gods, right? M- mythology. mythology, mythological gods. Um, this time around, though, he's a dad. Oh, I'm a dad. Yes. So basically, Kratos has moved out of Greece because he's it's just a wasteland now. He's just he's had revenge on everyone. He's just, he's just killed everyone. There's just no one about. There's no food. Killed farmers. Just everyone is gone. So he's gone to the Nordic realm. And as we know, the Nords mm. also have a whole host of mythological different gods. Yeah, like Thor, Fair. Odin. I've heard of him. Another one. Sure. I'm sure there's more than two. Um, so he has a whole new host of baddies to battle. But mainly, he does this because he just wants to raise his child in peace. Mm. 
Why didn't you just raise this child and... I don't know. I'm getting too into that. Okay. Now, uh, th- that sounds very counterintuitive. I don't want to give away spoilers. Fine. But this fine. one isn't called God of Peace. <laughs> right. So, obviously, something happens that, that kind of kind of moves this plot. Oh, you know how, like, when they make sequels of Hollywood films, mm. uh, it's the, the kind of... The set formula is just make the same film, but in Europe. Yeah, this is like make the same film, but in Sweden. But in Northern Europe. In Norway. Yeah. Mm. So, he's... So, uh, this is like God of War 2... European vacation. High jinks. Like yeah. he won't like the food. Yeah. They have some weird food. Mm. It'll be very cold and mm-hmm. he'll only pack shorts. There'll be people like in Bratislava, which he won't understand. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, so then number three, Mission to Moscow. Well, yeah, well I think this is like the fourth one. I okay. don't really want to... I don't want to incite all the people who will Fine, be, be writing in now and commenting and saying yeah. we got it wrong, but yeah, look, it's it, like the fourth or the fifth one. Fine. And, and you know, disclaimer here, I'm not a gamer, so, you know, that's... Yeah, that's, but anyway, uh, but th- this is actually... The, the interesting thing about this and probably why it went mainstream is because it kind of taps into this kind of interesting concept that has been going through a lot of mainstream media mm-hmm. at the moment. So I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, this game, Star Wars, Blade Runner, um, and the recent Wolverine flick, they all have the same theme, which is kind of sad, lonely, pained dads, if you think about it. Yeah. Yeah, I so, get that. So Luke Skywalker, he's guilty about his whole role in, in The Undoing of the Jedi. Uh, you have Deckard in Blade Runner, which I can't really tell you about unless you've seen it. And if, I, if you haven't seen it, then that's a spoiler. Yeah, fair. Which in itself may be a spoiler, but, you know, it just trust me if you haven't seen it. Mm. This, this plays into it. Um, Hugh Jackman in Wolverine, sad. Sad. Sad, angry dad. Sad, angry dad. Stabs a lot of people. Mm. It's basically the same story. Mm. Um, even Thanos in the Marvel Universe, obviously because Avengers is still topping box office lists, mm. he's a very sad dad by the end of it. So basically you're trying to tell me that the big trend in, in entertainment these days is sad dads. It's al- Sad dads slashing people, which is kind, <laughs> of, kind of worrying. <laughs> it's alpha males turned father figure. Mm. No, to the maturity of fatherhood. I, I, Which actually yeah. it, it resonates with me again. I am a, I am a father. I, I, I adore being a dad. I wouldn't say I was a sad dad, but I would say it. Part of what we kind of do at Esquire is explore the, the what makes man at his best, you know, mm. um, and that element of fatherhood and how that changes you is actually very relevant. Would you, if someone slighted you or your daughter, would you hunt down the god Zeus himself and chop his head off? I I think that would make a, a great like um I'd like to shout that into the mm. into the ether. But you wouldn't do it. Like if someone slighted me, I'd be like, I will hunt you down and you know, that would be a I would like to do that. By the beard of Zeus. But he actually Zeus had a beard. But he actually does it. So he's te- technically Kratos could be the greatest dad. Fair? In history. Dad of the year. Dad of the year. Yeah. Esquire <laughs> dad Esquire's of the year. dad of the year. <laughs> Don't hold me to that. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> right, perfect. Uh, that's that's the news. Well, actually, I have oh, one oh. more bit of news to add in. I'll add breaking news. Just as is breaking news, because just as we were walking in here today, uh, I got a nice little email and uh, an alert telling me that the Yasalam concert's second artist has been announced. So uh, for the Formula One Abu Dhabi Grand Prix mm-hmm. event, so the they've announced that the weekend will be playing on fr- on the Friday. Yep. Uh, and just now, hot off the presses, Tom, the announcement of the Sunday night gig is Guns N' Roses. Great. Yeah, man, Guns N' Roses coming in Sunday 25th of November That's for the, the SM concerts. What's the, what day? That's the last day. Yeah, so it's the final day after the Grand Prix. Guns N' Roses, Axel's going to be there, Slash is going to be, be there. That, that's a good headline. Who's the, who, so who was the first? Who did, who did they announce first? Uh, the Weekend. No, no. The, who's playing that weekend? Yeah, yeah the weekend. Formula is playing One on the weekend. weekend. Who's playing on that yeah, weekend? It, the weekend. Yeah. No, so Slash is playing that weekend. Yeah, and who else? And then then the weekend, which is when Slash is playing. Yeah, and then the weekend is playing on the Friday. The weekend is Friday and Saturday. Yeah, and then the weekend is playing on the weekend. Hmm. Weekend being obviously a very talented musical act. Ah, they're called the weekend. Well, he's called the weekend. He, it's a he. It's a he, and he spelt it wrong as well. What? Yeah, he he was, was one of those millennial missing out vowel kind it of things. It should be called either Friday or Saturday. Well, you know, got to get down on Friday, which ironically he is doing because he's playing on that weekend. Anyway, you can get tickets now. They're available. Early bird offers are available starting from 195 dirhams, uh, which is pretty nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, that's available till the 31st of May. Uh, it's Guns N' Roses, man. It's Axel. Yeah. Slash. Come on. That will... That will uh... I'm in. 
I feel a lot of people will go to see that. Yeah, man. A lot oh. of people will will go down specifically for that reason. Cool. So what's your favorite Guns N' Roses song? The one with the guns and <clears throat> the roses. And the roses. Paradise City gets me, man. Paradise yeah. City. Welcome to the Jungle. Sweet Child of Mine. All Fair. good ones. Um, cool. Yep. Yeah, that's the news. All right. Move on to the meaty bit. All right. And we're back after that all too brief break, I suppose. Well, what did you do in your break, Tom? Um... Not very much, really. <laughs> <laughs> More coffee, went for, went to the gym. It has been about <laughs> half a second. <laughs> yeah. Don't give away the secrets oh, of, sorry. Of, of... It's of, podcast uh, magic. It is it's podcast lore. Um, so this is the segment of the show where we delve into... Uh, one topic and kind of look at it a bit more in depth um, and for this week we are looking at the rise of the Chinese car segment um, not as boring as it sounds Tom mm, sounds pretty boring yeah no it's it's, it's fascinating when you think about it um, China makes cars now Tom because I'll tell you what you've heard of Volvo yes I have most people have heard of Volvo, the Scandinavian kind of uh, car company on safety and design purity. Very and safe all that. cars. That's yeah. what I know about sure. Volvo. Did you know that Volvo is owned by a company called Geely? No, I did not. Or Geely. Well, um, Wasn't Geely in a thing? Geely. Geely. Isn't that Lord of the Rings character? Game of Thrones. There's a Geely in Game of Thrones. Fair enough. She uh, owns Volvo? She doesn't own Volvo, no. But Geely or Geely is a Chinese car company that actually bought Volvo. Oh. Um, so they make Volvo. Um, and it is kind of all part of the massive boom in the Chinese automotive industry, uh, which we shouldn't be afraid of, but we should be very well aware that soon we will more than likely, as the rest of the world, be driving Chinese cars in the next So what are we talking years. about here? Because, so for example... I've got an iPhone here. This iPhone is made in China, mm. but as the back suggests, it was designed by Apple in California. Are we looking at this sort of thing, like the same way that China kind of makes everything, but really kind of the the design chops is, is based in, in the Western world? No, it's more of actual Chinese car companies set up in China creating ch uh, cars in China. Now... There was, the, the main kind of impetus of this is, well, I'll give you some stats. In 2016, as I'm reading mm -hmm. here, the Chinese car industry sold 23 million cars in one year. Is that a lot? That's a huge amount, 23 million cars. There's, right, there's for of, example. There's a lot of people in China. Yeah, I know. Okay, so another case in point of that is in the early 90s, uh, there was actually regulations because of, of mm. you know, ch uh, communism in China that people were not allowed to own a personal car. Because mm. cars belong to say you weren't allowed the personal possessions, right? So you're looking at one. I think the the current population of China is around 1.4 billion people. It's lots. Yeah. Let's just say lot. So now you're looking at people who haven't had personal cars in the last 70 mm -hmm. years. It's people. So it's a massive market mm. that is now buying cars, driving cars. You know, needing them to. It's a huge country, needing them to get around. Um, so that internal market is is enormous. Now, that is the focus of it there. But then there is further expansion plans and there'll be government regulations and stuff which, which will allow them to work with other car companies, potentially buy other car companies, mm -hmm. potentially go into collaboration with them. Um, that, that will be the future impact kind of globally. But at the moment, if uh, there are that many kind of Chinese car companies out there producing that many, it's not long before the rest of the market starts feeling that impact. True. Okay, that's all well and good. But I'd say that right now in the Western world, there's a lot less emphasis on your kind of vroom vroom cars and a lot more emphasis on electric cars. So sure. it's not going to be the case that by the time China, China like arrives, hmm. we're all going to be either in electric cars or with jetpacks or with drones. It's an interesting, it's a very, it's a very valid point. And the point it, it is tackled in this article, but example, when it comes to hybrid cars, there is an element that the Chinese government are therefore giving people, uh, giving companies uh, benefits for okay. developing Chinese cars. So instead of having to readapt, you know, Volkswagen and other major car companies there in in Europe and the rest of the world in the US, they're actually kind of starting from ground zero, if you will, mm. and giving given incentives and benefits for actually manufacturing uh, eco friendly cars from the off. Fair, and I guess that a lot a lot goes into those sort of cars. That the likes of Volvo will not be able to produce. Again, 
I imagine, I mean, Apple doesn't make the battery in my phone, mm. but I, I, I imagine some company in China does. So I will just dive in here and take you see, uh, there's an example that the, the article written by uh, the rather talented uh, writer Josh Sims, mm -hmm. um, he is saying there, for example, uh, the hybrid kinetic group, one of Chinese, uh, one of the Chinese brands that has worked with Pinaforina. Pinaforina is that famous Italian yeah, yeah. design company. They make all the nice, the nice looking cars. Yeah, they they designed the most iconic Italian Ferraris and Maseratis in history, mm. um, uh, amongst other things. The Juventus Stadium, for example, they they do. That's build not a car architecture. No, unless it is. Not yet. No. Oh. Yeah, not yet. Um, but they just signed a two hundred and fifty million dirham strategic partnership with the hybrid kinetic group um, to develop cars that will be fueled by bio-alcohol, propane, and natural gas. Um, the Geneva Motor Show earlier this year saw the unveiling of the HKGT, a saloon with the company, uh, yeah, well, this is basically a saloon that was electric, uh, electric driven, with an electric, electric driven powertrain. Mm. Therefore, showing the seriousness of this, seeing the, the design impacts, seeing the future um, economic, uh, ecological impacts of uh, and power that uh, that China have. A sleeping dragon, if you will, Tom. Sleeping giant or a sleepy panda. A sleepy panda. What, a sneezing panda. So what, uh, what, uh, I'm, I'm aware of all the major car companies in existence over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got your Mercedes, your BMWs, mm -hmm. your Ferraris, your Volvos. What sort of kind of, what are the, what, what, what kind of the type of cars, what are the brands that, that I will be, uh, driving over the next 10 years. Do we have any of them? Um, they, they kind of cover a different variety mm -hmm. from, you know, sports cars to, to kind of your general runarounds to more uh, professional ones, bands and things. Mm -hmm. uh, some names of Chinese car companies for yeah. you, Tom? Ftong. What? Ftong. What? I believe that's how it's pronounced. F-T-O-N. Oh, Ftong. Yeah. I thought you were saying something very different. No. Futon. Futon? No. Oh. Chang Feng. Chang Feng. CF. Yeah, I could. Cherry. I could. Cherry? Cherry. I'm not, I'd see, I'm not going to drive a cherry. What about a Hafei Towner? Fuga. What? <laughs> All those, mate. <laughs> what about Southeast? I feel that I can I, say that. So I can say Southeast, but yeah. They, they, yeah, I mean, cars first, airlines later. You know what the Southwest cherry, Airlines. the cherry cuke, a lot of, there's actually a lot of things about this and there's, there was a lot of kind of uh, stories online about the designers of these cars mm. being kind of very heavily influenced by cars that currently exist in the market. Uh, there have been lawsuits taken out. I won't mention brands and names, but there is an element of that. Mm. I guess, I mean, I had a Kender egg once <laughs> and it wasn't as good as the Kinder egg counterpart. Is that, is that what we're looking at? Uh, I once bought a pair of Reebok shoes, Tom. Yeah, yeah. and were they as good as... A pair of Reebok shoes. My pair of Reebok shoes fell apart after a couple of months. So I guess that's actually, the I think I, I didn't even wear them that long through the shame of owning a pair of <laughs> Reebok shoes. I guess that's the issue. It's kind of consumer confidence. Are people ready to buy a car that is not just kind of built in China, but completely Chinese? I.e., the the service would have to be Chinese. The um, I mean, Chinese marketing isn't necessarily ready for the Western world. Uh, I guess that that's kind of the big question. Yeah, look, China is an enormous country, and I think that all the infrastructure is being developed. Mm. Uh, it's it's very rural mm. in parts. It's very urban in other parts. So the interesting thing is when that market opens up for global dominance, who can stop it? Fair. Um, anyway, it's a fascinating piece to read out more. I may have butchered some facts in here. For that, I apologize, and I will take no legal responsibility for. Um, pick up the issue of Esquire. It's our May 2018 issue. It's blue. It's got Luke Evans on the cover. Mm -hmm. It says Luke Evans. Can't miss it. Uh, but that article is fascinating. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, I can employ you to read that. Yeah, you can learn all about the Fatong. Fatong cherry. Cherry QQ, Tom. Cherry QQ, because two Qs better than one. Yeah, three Qs, though. That's, you, that's next year's model. You wait for that one. That's next year's model. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's move on. Uh, so this is part three. This is where we talk to a man at his best or someone who kind of embodies all of uh, kind of the, the characteristics that we hold most dear here at Esquire. So Matt, you actually, um, you actually talked to this person that we're about to, to hear. In fact, I think your voice may be on the audio. Yeah, well, it's an interview. Oh, there we go. So, you know, it's rather than one man monologuing. Um, so who is it? Well, this week we 
uh, are focusing on a man who is the very embodiment of man at his best for in well that that's the general concept right but it's but it doesn't have to be a man it could be also a woman yeah absolutely 100% uh, this one is a man yeah uh, he is a man who is called Levison Wood now, if that name is familiar to you or if it isn't familiar to you, let me uh, wax lyrical about him for a few minutes. Levison Wood is basically, he's an adventurer, he's an explorer, he's a modern day adventurer. Mm. Uh, he's uh, Previously, he's done things like walked the length of the Himalayas, mm -hmm. uh, walked the length of the Nile, uh, walked, he does a lot of walking. He should get himself a Chinese car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he should get himself a Cherry QQ, a cherry then he wouldn't QQ. have to walk so a much. A <laughs> Tom. Um, he, yeah, but so uh, we spoke to Lev. Um, well, he, look, he's a fascinating man. Hmm. Uh, he is, uh, we spoke to him recently. I spoke to him on stage, actually, in, in a, a private event that we hosted with Esquire. Uh, he had just finished walking again. Um, Important. The, the Arabian Peninsula. So through Iraq, through Syria, through Saudi, through the UAE. Um, through Oman, uh, most of it on foot, some of it on camel, um, and writing about it. Does that He's... count? Yeah, well, I think mm. it, I think it was like methods of transport. Thesiger did it, right? So it's methods of transport that was... Is, yeah, but is, it's like, you just get in a car. I mean, if you're going to get in a camel, you may as well get in a car. No. I think well, you, lose the, you lose the drama, what about the adventure bike? of it. What about a bike, then? Could no. you bike under these rules? Well, I don't know what the rules are set up, but I think, you know, the, 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 the drama and the adventure of it all comes from that doing it on foot, right? Okay. But he's not on foot. He's I'm on camel sure, foot. But I'm pretty sure he took a couple of cars every now and then because there is one thing that he tells us about here where in this trip he ended up in a convoy that was ended up in the fight with ISIS. Oh. Um, there he tells us about stories where he's been eating maggots. Mm. Uh, and one time where when he was in the Himalayas, uh, him and his driver drove off a cliff. Were they in a fatong? No. I, I can't vouch for that, actually. He, he might have been. He might have been. That would be a twist. Um, anyway, so here is the audio of an interview that I did on stage with Leveson Wood at an event that Esquire did with Le Clos, um a few weeks back. And, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Oh, so, Leveson, welcome back to Dubai. Thank you. Um, we're going to have to share this microphone, otherwise we're going to have to share a lapel mic, which would have been interesting. But um, one of the things that, that fascinated me and basically made me most want to, to, to talk to you on stage is the idea of that, the modern explorer. Um, uh, you know, with the world being so interconnected, is that age of exploration, is that age of the great explorer finished? Or, or how, do you, how do you position yourself in today's world? Um. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, what does exploration mean in, in the modern era? And I guess, I think for me, you know, we're longer the days gone where we're planting flags in maps and, and naming mountains and things like that. I think exploration really in, in this day and age is about documenting a moment in time. And we live in very interesting times. Um, borders open, borders close. Um, only recently, um, less than a decade ago, a, a new, um, entire rainforest was discovered in Mozambique thanks to Google, thanks to Google Earth. And I think, you know, we live in an age where technology really dictates um, our potential and our capacity and, 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 you know, there are still lots of places to explore. Um, and I think it's in our genes. It's in our, you know, as, as human beings, um, we like to see what's beyond the next horizon. I don't know if you've heard of the explorer's gene. I've read your book. Yeah, it's in my book. It's, um, there's actually a gene mutation for those that haven't. Um, it's called DRD47R. Hope you've got your notepads out. It's, um, it's actually a gene mutation that affects 20% of the human population. Highly prevalent on, among nomadic peoples, um, the Bedouin, for instance. Um, and I guess in the modern context, it, um, it, it's all to do with the levels of dopamine in your brain and how your brain reacts to change movement. It, it basically makes you more like, you know, more... Um, likely to embrace movements, to embrace risk, um, to try new foods, to try new drinks and things like that. And, uh, and actually, it also encourages people to take up certain types of lifestyles. So astronauts, pilots, um, soldiers, you know, any, any career or lifestyle that in, entails an element of risk. And of course, those of us who like to travel. So I think it's deeply ingrained in a certain percentage of people's um, psyche and their DNA. And, and so I think there will always be, as long as it's humans, there will always be people that want to explore. I'm going to guess that you're one of the people who has that gene. Well, I've not been tested. But. <laughs> Fair. The, um, 
For those, uh, to give you a little bit of recent history on Levison, he has completed, recently completed a, an on-foot uh, walk through the Arabian Peninsula, which is uh, why he's visiting us this weekend and, uh, and currently writing, writing your book on that, really. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. And, and, but what I'm interested in is that element of the Middle East that you see that, you know, uh, we live here, so what is that element of the, of the Middle East that having gone through that journey that surprised you the most, something that you weren't expected and perhaps uh, noticed? Um, I think my journeys, uh, the one thing that I've taken away from my journeys is that is the diversity. You know, I, I've walked the length of the Nile, all, you know, halfway across Africa, the length of the Himalayas, through Central America, um, the fringes of Europe, all these different places. And what's always struck me is, is just that amazing diversity, the amazing hospitality as well, of, we, the places that tend to be in the news for all the wrong reasons, um, actually, you tend to be welcomed the most. And, and for me, I, I've always been interested in, in this region. I travelled here as a, a student backpacker. I found myself in the middle of the uh, Iraq war in 2003 somehow. Um, and I've always wanted to come back and, and sort of do it justice and, and hopefully look beyond the headlines and, and try and show some of the more positive human stories. So this was my um, opportunity to come back to the region. Um, I wanted to do a, an expedition sort of akin to the other journeys that I've done, um, traveling, you know, at the slowest pace, you know, with, whether that's with a camel or a donkey or whatever, and, and do it the traditional way. And so I, I did a circumnavigation of the peninsula starting up in Syria, and I traveled through Iraq, through um, all the way around the Gulf, um, and, uh, you know, the whole, the whole spectrum. So it was a fascinating journey, and I think for me the, the interesting parts were going to places like Syria, like Iraq, um, and showing something other than war and conflict, because there are lots of normal people living normal lives there as well. Sure. What, um, is, is there any particular kind of, I don't want to run too many spoilers from the book that you're writing, but um, is there any particular standout anecdotes from, from Syria or Iraq that, uh, that jump to mind, or that you're willing to share? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there were, there were numerous, numerous, um, incidents, there was a few close calls, I managed to get ambushed by ISIS in Iraq. Um, we were sort of found ourselves somehow, not intentionally, but somehow embedded onto the, the final um, assault against ISIS on the Hawija offensive um, last, just before Christmas. Um, and that wasn't planned, that was just a local guy who said, do you want to see some action? And we yeah, said yes, and followed him into right to the front line and found ourselves in the second vehicle on the convoy. Um, so, you know, you, when you undertake these expeditions, you do find yourself in some quite remarkable um, situations. Yeah. Uh, quite, re quite remarkable is one way of putting it. Um, one of the, the common threads in, in, a lot of your, in a lot of your travels, and, and especially your, your written work, is that element of hospitality. Um, people, regardless of where they are, and regardless of where you've been, generally seem to be quite welcoming of you. Um, what's are there any particular incidents that uh, that stand out for you? Not necessarily in the one in the Rainbow Peninsula, but uh, but maybe on the Nile. Or I don't know if, if there's anything you'd like to share. I mean, uh. yeah, I mean that um, sense of hospitality is something that's endured with me and, and really kept me going because um, I'll never forget probably one of the most hospitable places that I've travelled to is is Sudan. And before I went there, I'd sort of heard the headlines. I'd heard about the sort of reports of genocide, of famine, of conflicts, and all the rest of it. But what I wasn't quite prepared for was this overwhelming sense of incredible hospitality. Everywhere I went, people would run out of their homes, offering me food, offering me cups of tea, water, um, to the point where my Bedou guides were, were sort of annoyed because it was slowing us down and they wanted to get home in time for Ramadan. Um, and we only had two months to get through Sudan, which sounds like a long time, but when every single village you stop at um, insists that you stay there and um, they offer to build you a house, it can be quite time consuming. Um, so my guides insisted that for, for parts of the, t for the journey, we'd, we'd walk away from the villages in the desert and we'd camp out in the sand dunes rather than accept the hospitality of the, of the villagers. But of course, when you make a little campfire, you know, a mile away from the villages, they all come out because they're all curious as to what, who these people are in the desert. And before you know it, you're surrounded by these shadowy figures, the, the villagers asking you why you're not accepting their hospitality, and you feel a little bit ungrateful. Um, and I'll never forget when one guy got so annoyed that we hadn't accepted his invitation that he stormed off um, back to his house, came back half an hour, he carried his bed on his head and said, if you're not going to come into my house, my house is coming to you. And that is really a sign of the kind of place that Sudan is. And I've, I've found that level of hospitality um, across the world, but particularly in this region as well. 
One of the uh, early in, uh, I suppose when I was first reading your, your earlier works, um, you did a lot of hitchhiking. Now hitchhiking, I don't know, where I grew up was always considered to be a bit of a no-no and you'd always be advised against it, but it's something that you really kind of drew, that really kind of uh, enticed you. Uh, why is that and is it as dangerous as people kind of make out? I mean, you've got to be careful, obviously, um, but for me, it was an opportunity as a, you know, a, a young backpacker. I mean, I started hitchhiking when I was sort of 18, and, and um, you, perhaps you can call me lucky or, or slightly reckless, but um, I actually found that by, by hitchhiking, by accepting the hospitality of, of local people, you know, the vast majority of people are out there to help you. And actually, w when you're young, I mean, it gets slightly more difficult when you're older, but when you're, when you're young, people want to look after you. They, they feel a little bit sorry for you and, uh, and want to look after you. So that's, that was my experience. Um, and with the, the journeys that I've been doing recently, I, I've kind of wanted to try and see how it is you know, slightly older and see what the reception's like. And I've, I've actually been, had my faith in humanity restored so many times because people will go vastly out of their way to make sure that you get to your, you know, wherever you want to get to. And people will often drive, you know, sometimes hundreds of miles out of their way just to drop you off somewhere that you need to get to. And, and that is, is something that re does reaffirm your faith. And um, yeah, I, I just enjoy it because you get to meet lots of new people. It's, uh, that's actually, it's, it's well put actually, because one of the, my next question was you is that element of, the, of all the people that you meet along, along your expeditions and that, uh, what's that kind of, what's the one virtue that, that redeeming human quality virtue that, that stands out most to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, lots of, lots of people from all different walks of life are, you know, I've met um, everyone from, from shepherds to warlords to, you know, Get cr criminal gang bosses to the Dalai Lama, um, and th 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 I think the one, the one theme, the one, uh, I guess, thing that I've taken away from that is that wherever you go, people are effectively the same. They want to be left alone. They don't want too much interference from the powers that be. They want to. They want peace. They want to just get on with their lives. And, and that's certainly something that I found from from this region. You know, and I, I've seen it. I've seen the various conflicts along the way from both sides. Um, and that can be quite controversial, um, embedding yourself with, with different sides and, and trying to show the stories objectively. But what I found is that the resounding um, theme is that people just want peace. And actually, it's a, it's a small minority for whom conflict is in their, in their vested interest. For most people, they just want to get on with their lives and get on with whatever they enjoy doing. I think, I think that's very well put. Um, you are currently writing... Uh your, your next, your next novel, or your next book. Um, how important is that process for you in terms of closure? In terms of going through, you know, some quite harrowing situations for for months on end, and then that element of arriving back in the UK, and you know, there's there's your laptop. Go go for it. I mean, what what is that? How important is it important to you, basically? It's always weird getting at the end. You know, some of my journeys have been you know nine months. You know, the Nile took me nine months of walking. Um, when you suddenly get back to a city, big city, whether that's you know, somewhere like this or London, um, you feel as though you hit a bit of a brick wall. And I'll, I'll never forget getting back from the Himalayan journey, and uh, it was Black Friday. I didn't even know what Black Friday was. It, but apparently it involves you know, tearing each other's hair out over the, uh, the latest sort of big widescreen TV. Um, and it's a bit, you know, having spent lots of time in, in areas of you know, incredible poverty, um, where people literally have, have got nothing, but will go out of their way to help you, or, or would they'd rather die than than let you go without a drink of water? You know, so that uh, it really gives you that sense of humility, and um, you, you just feel slightly humbled by it. And so going back home and, and seeing this, you know, this this sort of slightly you know gratuitous consumerism, you you tend to be a little bit overawed, um, and then you just have to go for a Burger King and get over yourself, really, don't you? I think that's the <laughs> The only thing to be done. Um, for me, the writing is, is really a way of laying out my thoughts. Uh, and it is, like you say, it's quite a cathartic experience because you, um, you get to relive it. Um, and you get to, for me, one of the joys of doing these journeys is the ability to share it with other people. People that don't necessarily have the opportunity to go and do the journeys or, quite frankly, wouldn't want to. Um, and it, it, I think it is a good way of, of hopefully showing um, not just my journey, but other cultures and a bit of bit of history, a bit of um, local culture, and um, you know, without being judgmental. And I think that hopefully is can only be a good thing. So that was that. Um, fascinating, Matt. Fascinating. Thanks, man.
Uh, He's a genuinely like a, a fascinating character. I could talk to him all day. Mm. Excellent. Uh, so we do hope that everyone um, at home, or I mean, maybe you were listening to us at work, or potentially even on the commute, maybe in your Cherry QQ, maybe you're on, on the bus, or even the Dubai Metro. Maybe you're walking, Tom. No one walks, except for Levison. Levison. Hi, Levison. The only walker who listens to our show. So everyone should remember, we have new episodes coming out weekly on Apple iTunes, SoundCloud, Pocket Casts, and more. Um, and we also host each individual show on our website, which is esquireme.com, as well as YouTube, which presumably, if you're if you're watching us, that's how you, you've you already discovered that. You don't need me to tell you. Mm, I'm pointing at the camera right now and waving at you. Uh, please don't forget to check out... Um, our social media uh, accounts for more daily goings on from Esquire Middle East, which, uh, if you don't know, Matt, is the largest men's luxury lifestyle title in the region and probably the world. Possibly the world. Tom. Oh, probably. It's 100% the leading men's lifestyle brand in the region. Yes. So, um, with that, uh, I will see everyone next week. Cool. Click subscribe down here. Um, for those just listening on podcasts, I'm pointing to something on YouTube. All right. Or click subscribe if you're on SoundCloud. Um, uh, if you're on Apple iTunes, just just subscribe. It's just, just easier. Follow us, man. This Otherwise, we'll have to come to your house, yeah, and it's, it's going to be a bit weird. Yeah. Then you'll have to cook. No one likes that. No. All right. Cool. See everyone soon. See you later.